And our second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans. A little bit of a context. Paul, as you know, was once Saul, a Roman citizen and a self-described Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a zealot. And Saul became famous for ridding his beloved Judaism from the corrupting influences of, a, of the followers of this charismatic preacher, teacher, healer, radicalizing rabbi, disturber of the peace, whose followers scandalously claimed that he, Jesus, was the Messiah. That's the Greek word, that's the Hebrew word. And in Greek, it's the Christ, the Christos, the Christ. And so for this, Jesus was crucified by the Roman government. And yet his spirit, the spirit of unconditional love lived on, lived on in his followers, lives on including us. So hear this brief excerpt from this passage because I'll refer to it later in my, my sermon. Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 18. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. Glory, may we rise up to glory through the courageous work of love, the transforming work of love. Yom Kippur, which is celebrated this week, is really all about that work, that the world is broken in need of repair, and our only hope begins through the repair within ourselves and through the deep conviction that we are already beloved and we are called to love. And much like Jesus, Paul, the author of Romans, loved Judaism and would have been attending the highest of holy days, Yom Kippur, celebrated this week, which is all about that ongoing reformation. And no one really knows if Paul or Jesus, for that matter, were setting out to form a new religion or simply seeking the ongoing reformation that is essential to any living faith that's inherent within Judaism. No one really knows precisely also what happened to change Paul's mind when he was persecuting those followers of the ways of Jesus. There's the story of the road to Damascus, but I believe that Paul was changed through the direct experience of unconditional love, the life-changing, life-transforming experience of love. And more than anything, I believe he wanted to share this life-giving, life-changing, life-transforming experience as widely as he could across time. Yet Paul's writings aren't as straightforward as they're made out to be. On the one hand, Paul earlier in Romans says that those who trust God are excused from following the law as a road to salvation. Faith in God is all that's required, Paul says, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In other words, all you have to do is believe that you're saved and you are. Nothing else is required. Does that sound familiar to you? Sounds familiar to me. But here's the complication. That same Paul who said we could stop worrying about the requirements of the law 
turns right around and gives us this whole new set of imperatives in today's reading. And they're printed in your bulletin. I want to just go through them in more detail now. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay evil for evil, but take thought of what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. But Paul never says that salvation depends on following these imperatives on this list. His appeal is to people who already belong to God, who are already committed to worshiping God. So this long list that I just read is a list of what it means to worship God. How do you think you're doing? How do you think I'm doing? How do you think we're doing? Well, if you think that worshiping God is like what we do between like 10 o'clock and it starts right at 10 and then it ends at 11 or maybe it goes a little bit over to 12, you know, to enjoy the sushi that Jim Schubert's bringing this morning. Um, and um, we can hold ourselves. I can stop from avenging myself because there are some council members here. And uh, Sheila's not here today, but somebody's collecting for the offering for the saints and we're welcoming visitors. I'm feeling kind of zealot for an hour. How about you? <laughs> I really believe that Paul had something more extensive in mind. This kind of worship, sure, but the hard work of day by day, minute by minute, love, love of whoever happens to be standing right there in front of you, whether you feel like it or not, with no one to remind you what to do next, not, not the benefit of clergy or rabbis or imams or sanctuary or congregation or beautiful anthems like we just heard this morning. Paul gives us basically like an order of service, which doesn't tell us what to do or when exactly, but gives us a list, like an audit of how we're doing. How many of you find yourself, I confess I do this with my brother, half listening to my brother while he's on the phone going on and on sometimes, and I'm checking my email. Paul says, let love be genuine. How many of you find yourself putting other people down who have different beliefs and support different political parties than you do? Outdo one another in showing honor. Sitting in a meeting with someone who helpfully points out the flaws in everything you say, bless those who persecute you. Anybody getting angry? <laughs> this quiet, unsung, under the radar worship of God 
may not be big enough and visible enough for some of us. Depending on where you are in your life or your faith, your temperament, doing something really big can seem like the best way to serve God. I was thinking about firefighters. They get all the attention because it's so huge. There's a big fire, right? What about the people who quietly prevent them? This is that kind of work. It's the quiet acts of love 